Okay, good. All right. Welcome, one and all. Uh, super pleased to see you and that you've had the time to attend today's lecture with speaker Dr. Tom Parker. First, let me introduce myself. I'm Mila Stroganov, Programs Director for Friends of San Pedro Valley Park. For the past two years or so, you have seen me in front of a computer screen. Uh, facilitating the webinars that I organized due to COVID and restrictions placed on all of us to stay apart. This coming lecture season will be a hybrid. We'll be part in person and part as webinar. Let me give you a heads up on our upcoming in-person lecture with Dr. Shannon Bennett. She will present a lecture on Saturday, November the 12th at 3 p.m. at the Visitor Center on Animal to Human Infectious Disease Transmission, Present and Future. Dr. Bennett is Chief of Science and Harry W. and Diana B. Hind, Dean of Science and Research Collections at the California Academy of Sciences. Dr. Shannon Bennett is responsible for the Academy's programs of scientific research and exploration as well as overseeing the Academy's priceless collection of nearly 46 million scientific specimens from around the world. So mark your calendars, and I hope to see you here for this coming event. Now for our speaker, Dr. Tom Parker, who you, you well know, Professor of Biology Emeritus, San Francisco State University, will present a talk Manzanitas is a whole ecosystem replaced in the ecology of California. He was professor of biology at San Francisco State University for 40 years and is now emeritus. He is a plant ecologist, evolutionist, focusing on plant community dynamics and conservation. He is an expert in the systematics and ecology of Arctostaphylus, Manzanitas species co-author of Treatments for Flora of North America in 2009, and Jepson Manual, Higher Plants of California in 2012. He has done research on dispersal, <coughs> seed banks, seedling establishment, and fire response, mycorrhizae, and other aspects of ecology <coughs> and ev evolution in a variety of California vegetation types, especially chaparral, and tidal wetlands. He has written over a hundred peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, three edited books, one co-author field guide to Manzanitas, which is in a second edition now. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Tom Parker. It's a pleasure to be back in front of you guys again. And I had a choice of doing this as a Zoom or as in person. And I wanted it to be in person because I like seeing the, the heads. <laughs> because uh, speakers really enjoy the interaction with the audience. Right? That, if you don't interact, I lose energy. But if you interact, I gain energy. <laughs> And I'll start ragging you at that point, and you'll know that I'm in good shape. <laughs> I want to talk today, if you've come to the previous ones, you know I'm a nerd about Manzanitas. And most of the previous talks have been about this, about Manzanitas, that, about Manzanitas. I'm going to do a little bit different thing today. I want to talk to you about all of the organisms that deal with Manzanitas. Because by themselves, they create an entire ecosystem. There's a huge uh, biodiversity that you may or may not have noticed uh, are actually associated with. That's what we'll get into, but I'll give you a little context first so that uh, we can just flow through the rest of it. And hopefully this will work, because it worked earlier. Mm -hmm. there we go. Don't you love it when all your technology fails? <laughs> Here's the distribution of this genus Manzanitas all throughout the northern hemisphere except that 
This is almost all just one species. Arthostaph was uberursi, or bearberry. Right? That's just a very different kind of plant from everything that you're used to in this state. And that's where everybody else is. In the California touristic province uh, is about 96 to 100 of them. Um, about 104, 106 total worldwide. There's some in Mexico and Baja and uh, some in Arizona. Uh, we have to in California, this is what it looks like. Most of the diversity is along the coast, in the coast ranges, and especially in the central coast range, which is sort of the, the northern piece of it. This is mostly just one species. This is three, and all of this area are two species or one. So it's uh, not a really diverse world outside of uh, California, but they are important components uh, of those places. Now, I'm assuming that you tend to think about chaparral and manzanitas as part of really dry, uh, hot places because they're chaparral plants. Right? But in reality, if you look for where all that diversity is, they're right on the coast. Or like here in this county park, they're just uh, a few kilometers from the coast. And what does the coast have? Oh. Oh, yes. <laughs> that marine layer that comes in and is outside for some reason here in October. Uh, and that marine layer is really important for all these plants because it conserves moisture, the cloud cover prevents the sun from warming them up. Uh, the higher humidity and cooler temperatures reduces water loss from their leaves. And that means they can survive that dry summertime period right, without, any more, without any rainfall. And we're getting worse. If you look at the coast of California, and this is just from the Bay Area of Santa Barbara, you can see that in some places uh, the fog invades a little bit more than in other places. And it's where they in the fog invades that we have a higher diversity of manzanitas because the fog's able to find a lot of different soil types in those places in manzanitas will specialize on different soil types. So that if you start off in the Bay Area, we have super high diversity of manzanitas. There's about um, 50 of them if you include Monterey, but let's not include Monterey because it has its own a very high diversity of species. If you go to Morro Bay to San Luis Obispo area, the fog enters there as well. And there's another place of very high Manzanita diversity on the hills on either side of San Luis Obispo. And one other place, the Santa Inez Valley. Um, either the northern or the southern end of that valley, the fog is able to enter, and there's, again, a lot of uh, endangered and limited species in that place. I like all of those places. <laughs> I've been to all of them. They all have really nice looking manzanitas. <laughs> now, what does this mean? This means that you have this kind of situation with fog, a manzanita-dominated chaparral, and it turns out that conifers like the same kind of places. They can tolerate the dry, uh, nutrient-poor soils. There's another reason, too, because manzanitas and conifers uh, can share mutualists. And I don't mean above-ground mutualists. I mean below-ground mutualists that help them establish seedlings. And that's why they can uh, interact with each other. And we'll have a little bit more about that later. But I want you to remember this uh, particular slide. One other piece about manzanitas, which is really key to most of the state, is it burns. And in fact, they have seed that's dormant, and the seed won't germinate unless they experience fire. They need chemicals from smoke. So you can mess with them if you want. You can go into a stand with a little bottle of liquid smoke from the grocery store, uh, dilute it out and then start pouring it all over the soil. And as long as they get a heat pulse, which you then have to figure out how to give them, and in a cold winter, uh, you'll start seeing seedlings in the spring. You can, you can mess with them. Isn't that kind of fun? 
not, not, not too many plants interact with you as well. Now, I also point out that they are dependent on particular fire regimes. And the reason for that is they're not adapted to fire, per se. They're adapted to a particular pattern. And that pattern is long time periods between fires. You can't burn them every year or every other year or every fifth year. If you do that, you degrade the stands. You wipe out two thirds of them right away. And the others slowly uh, extirpate, shall we say. So they're, they're used to long time periods, which means fuel management is something uh, that needs to take that into consideration, which they often don't. But we can argue about politics later. The other thing about this group is that fire doesn't kill the plants necessarily. A third of them just re-sprout. They have a wooden base, and that's called a burl. And that wooden base is filled with hundreds of dormant buds. And when the top of the plant uh, is burned, or if you were to go in there and chop it all up, um, it releases all the buds and they uh, break out and start regrowth. But two-thirds of the plants are like this. They're completely dead after a fire. And they are dependent completely on seed that's in the soil that are physiologically dormant until the fire comes and stimulates them uh, to germinate. So these are called obligate seeders because they have to have seed in the soil to keep their stands. And these are called facultative seeders because they also have dormant seed in the soil. Uh, but they only need a few individuals to establish after each fire. Most of them survive. And this is what the manzanita babies look like. They already have red bark. And somebody's already eaten one of them. It's a tough life. Think about it for a minute. They both have dormant seed in the soil, but a bunch of them can re-sprout, so most of the population survives each fire cycle. This group, none of the adults survive the fire. Natural selection is going to act on these two groups a little bit differently, especially on whose seedlings can establish and, and do well. It's, uh, not a big deal for this group. They only need a few to make it every fire cycle. This group needs everybody as much as possible to make it or else the population does not come back. So it's a, a different world in Manzanitas for these two different lineages. And yet they all seem to be pretty much the same in their responses. Now, Another thing about them is, unlike their close relatives, the Manzanitas have very different fruit. They have dried fruit. This is what their close relatives look like. You might be familiar with madrones. There are a bunch of them here. And when madrones produce fruit, roughly this time of year, but they ripen in November and December, uh, you'll end up with these large, red, fleshy fruits. And they have a lot of chambers, and in those chambers are small seed with very thin uh, endocarps. And an endocarp is just the innermost piece of the fruit, the mother plant. And you might be familiar with things like uh, peaches, which are fleshy fruited, and they have a pit. And the pit part, you can break open and see the seed. Well, that outer stony part is the inside of the fruit, the inside of the mother plant. It's the same thing with um, this plant, but that's not but the endocarp is really thin. In this one, summer holly, if you know it, you're from Southern California. This, this is basically from Santa Barbara County <coughs> South. Um, it's also fleshy fruited, and when they ripen, they're bird dispersed as well. Um, but all of their seeds are in thicker, stony endocarps, and they're all fused together into a single structure that you can see in three different ones. So it's a, a pretty different system. And what you're seeing is evolution from trees uh, to shrubs. And they haven't quite changed all of their characters to fit into a shrub one yet, but they're getting there. And when you go to Manzanitas, you end up with a totally different world. 
Now we have dry fruit. Here are five different species, different sizes, okay? different shapes. Some of them are basically round, and some of them are flattened, and they have little uh, indentations uh, to in, two sides of the polar tips, and the shape looks a little bit like an apple, and that's where the common name comes from, manzanita, little apple. Okay. Now if you take off all the outer parts, which are dry, and a lot of them have a, a the flesh is dry, and mealy, but if you remove all that, this is what the insides look like. In some cases, they're also all fused together, all the endocarps, there's about seven different seed there, but in some cases they fall apart and they'll be found individually in the soil. So it's a little bit different, and that's something I want you to remember because this isn't random. This is something that's been selected for and it's a character that distinguishes them from all their, their close relatives. Okay? And it's a way for them to manipulate uh, their dispersal agents. The other thing to remember, here's one species and here are five different fruit that I've opened up. Um, the fusion of the endocarps together is variable. So and sometimes they're completely fused together like you see a big berry man to eat it. But in other cases they fall apart to some extent. That's also a key piece, right? Because it makes them unpredictable. And that's an important piece. It worked. Are they it's always shocking when it works. Are they edible? Um, the manzanita fruit, the outer part, um, well, yeah, yeah, but you make tea out of it. Oh, okay. You don't, you don't eat it. Otherwise, you can, you'll have a lot of dental work. <laughs> But um, you can make a good tea. It's, uh, a lot of them are very sweet, uh, but only the skin is sweet. But the mesocarp has a lot of flavor. Uh, you just don't want to put it in your mouth. You put it in water, then filter it off. You can make a tea. So I want you to be thinking about this. What's going on? What's happening? What's causing the plants that are close relatives to go from fleshly, very fleshy bird dispersed fruit uh, with very small seed to uh, dry fruit with these stony endocarps and all sorts of, well, I sort of fused or completely fused or not at all. Okay. Keep that in mind. Now, we'll do one other little sidetrack before I get into the other one. And I want to remind you that these are beautiful plants. It's another reason to work with things if you think they're beautiful. It's a lot easier to go in the field on a miserable day. Oh, it's going to be 110 today. Well, I'll drink a lot of water, but I'll be with beautiful plants. <laughs> okay. Just to remind you of how pretty they are. They have, most of them have this smooth uh, reddish bark. Uh, these are dormant inflorescences that they produce in the spring, and they just keep them dormant until the first winter rains. So they'll sit on the plants for months. Uh, when they do bloom, they're beautiful. And if you're out there on a sunny day, it smells like someone has spilled a bunch of honey. It can be really uh, overwhelmingly pleasant. And when they do get new growth in the spring, some of the species have a lot of anthocyanins, so red color is very prominent in those plants. And uh, the horticulturalists go out and they differentially will select this kind of response so that you can put it in your yard and be very impressed. Okay. More beauty. I just, I even think the ones we sprouting are gorgeous. So you just have to put up with me. <laughs> If you get close enough, you, you can see that some of them have unusual uh, hair associated with them. And that hair uh, is, in this case, glandular. And that means there are these little sticky balls at the tip of the hairs. And those repel insects uh, from eating them. That's uh, an effective way to do it. And if you go up into 
the Sierra Nevada, this is the Greenleaf Manzanita at high elevation. And if you have a little hand lens, you can actually uh, check out uh, the glandular hairs. In this case, they're, they're yellow, uh, the little balls. And if you look at a key, if you're trying to key them out, uh, which I know all of you do every time you come to they're sometimes called golden uh, glandular hairs. But on the coast here, we have water plants with glandular hairs, but they're usually clear. Uh, sometimes they're pink. Pink is really cool. When you look at that, you go, oh my god. I'm so happy I came out today. <laughs> And if a fungus gets in there, they can be black. Meanwhile, here we go. Just uh, amazingly impressive plants in my view. So I thought I'd give you a little tour of the Bay Area before um, we get into some other detail. And this is uh, Arctosaphilus canescens. Um, this one grows, this is from Mount Tamalpais, but it also grows in the Santa Cruz Mountains, if you know where to work. Because the Santa Cruz Mountains is the southernmost end of this range. But um, from Napa County north to Oregon, it's a, one of the most prominent uh, of the Manzanitas. But I really like this one because it has just a single cluster of flowers in its inflorescence, and it has this tightly woven white hair all over it. Uh, pink flowers, sometimes they're white depending upon the population. Uh, uh, when you get the pink flower ones, it's impressive. I don't know if you would admit. Um, if you go across the bay to the Oakland and Berkeley Hills, you can find this one, the Palette or Alameda Manzanita. Um, this is brand new growth, so it's not what you would see when you get out there. And the new growth is really pretty. Right? You have this red veining and uh, the leaves are brighter green, but as this one matures, the leaves will turn a little pallid. Mm -hmm. So a little whitish kind of green color. San Bruno Mountain, if you know where to look, uh, this is a map of an Archistaphilus, the San Bruno Mountain uh, Manzanita. Um, it has very uh, tiny petioles, so the leaves are right against the stem, and they have earlobes, and as a consequence, they're called auriculate leaves, and those earlobes go around the stem. And so you can see it's a really pretty plant when it's in full bloom. And you would also get views of San Francisco and all the birds that are up there. Take off on any of these trails and you'll find this one, the Brittle Leaf Manzanita. It has that woody base where you can re-sprout or see re-sprouts from. So it's kind of a cool one. Uh, but you also have a local endemic, the Montero Mountain Manzanita. And it can be huge. Uh, this one is on one of the trails here, except that I think it fell, because uh, I took this picture about 35 years ago, <laughs> and I've tried to find it again. Um, but there are plenty of other really big ones in other spots. It's a nice, it's a nice one. So the brittle leaf that we saw that's up your trail, I wanted to point out it has really long hair. It, they're very soft. Uh, but none of them are glandular. And don't forget the burls. And if you see burls and long hair with no glands, that's the brittle leaf in this county park. Um, but the Montero Mountain Manzanita also has a lot of hair, but there's a lot of glandular hair in that area. And there's no burl. So as you're walking the trails and you see these big plants, these are also auriculate, so you can look for the earlobes. Uh, the brittle leaf isn't. So you can tell them about you read it. Just go down the Santa Cruz Mountains a little ways and you can see this one. Uh, this one is called Lutnosa or Schriever's Manzanita. He's the one who found it. Uh, it also has that little tight, short white hair that in some cases is interwoven. This one is really cool because the flowers, if you open the flowers up and look at the ovary, the ovary is covered with glandular hairs, and sometimes there's a crown of pink glandular hairs. And the first time I saw that, I was like, I can't believe this. Why isn't it called the pink crown? <laughs> this one is hard for you to see because uh, the entire population is on uh, Monterey Shale inside the property of uh, Lockheed. So, Lockheed. Uh, 
So they're doing you know, important research there. Uh, you can get on the property, but they will send somebody with you. <laughs> there has to be a reason for you to go see them. You, you understand. It was a lot easier before 9-11. It was really hard after that. Um, another relative is this one, the Santa Cruz Mountain Manzanita. This one is huge. Um, a little bit further north around um, Kings Mountain, there's another uh, close relative of this one that's also huge. Uh, but I don't have a good photo of that one. But this one you can see is rather large. That's me as a young person. And you can tell how long I've been doing this. <laughs> it has a wonderful uh, inflorescence. Uh, a lot of different branches with lots of flowers. If you look carefully, there's a lot of glandular hairs in there as well. A little bit further south in Croondale, you can go to Manzanita Park. And in Manzanita Park, there's a bunch of Manzanitas. And this is one that you only find in the Pajaro Hills called Pajaroensis. And it is really cool. It's, this particular one is, is natural at the site, but I used to have one in my front yard. It was a horticultural selection. And in the new growth, these leaves would be brilliant red. And then as they mature, they would turn into this kind of color, a little blue-green hint uh, with, the, with the red edges. Really a, a, a nice plant. Again, another curricular one. All those are coastal. So there's a lot of them out here. It's unusual in that it doesn't have the smooth red bark. It has this uh, shreddy uh, gray bark. So it's pretty different in that case. But you can see it, it can be a pretty big plant too. Um, across the valley and onto the Fremont Peak area, uh, there's some granite outcrops. And on the granite outcrops, you find uh, the Gavilon Manzanita. It's another really pretty one that's also quite large. Uh, again, with the white fuzz. Uh, but what's really impressive about this one is it has gigantic red fruit. Yeah. And, and what's really impressive about this one is I'm one of the people who named it. So. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten that response on a Zoom call, right? Yeah. You would have all been going, what? I'm, I'm playing solitaire, so. Okay. Now, what's really impressive to me about these plants is not just their beauty, which is great, not just their ecology that I've been studying, like how they respond to fire, um, things like that, but they support massive amounts of biodiversity, probably a lot more than uh, you might expect. And in that sense, they actually represent their own ecosystems. Okay, so let's start with a few different aspects of them so that you can see how this works. And one of them is um, flowering. Plants are pretty passive about flowering, so animals have to come to them. And you probably won't be shocked to find out that even though they bloom in December and January and February, the middle of winter, uh, bumblebees are emerging at that time, especially the queens, and they really depend upon early flowering plants. How many things are blooming in December and January? Almost nothing, but manzanitas are in full bloom, and the bumblebees are there to take the nectar and pollen and to get their uh, new babies going as they help manzanitas get new babies. A lot of other species are involved that are native bees, uh, most of them in uh, a lineage called andrenids. Um, they're small and variable. They're kind of cool. Some of them are so small that they can't get all the way to the nectar, so they'll climb up the side of the flower and they'll drill a little hole in the side and cheat. And they aren't going to be fertilizing the plant, so, hmm, oh well, they're supporting a native bee and that's important. Bee flies, maybe you remember those. They kind of look like a bee, but then they hover. They're cool. And they'll go, and for a manzanita flower, they'll go up, uh, hovering. Uh, another tiny uh, andrenid bee that's actually drinking nectar out uh, of one of those little holes that they've created. Don't you love that? 
other things, a lot of butterflies and moths are also uh, pollinate these guys. This is a morning fog. And of course, if there's any hint of pink in them, um, hummingbirds will come and visit. Them. They'll come and visit in my yard. In fact, they fight over parts of my yard. But I do have nine manzanitas in the yard, so that's, that helps. Another thing about manzanitas and their pollinators is they not only um, flower in the middle of winter, but there's so many different types that they spread out that flowering period. Because manzanitas have two different lineages, and they're not that closely related, and they vary their timing of flower. So that one flowers, one lineage flowers early, December, January, the other is delayed. And they also have two levels of, of ploidy. So a lot of them are diploid, so you guys are all diploid. So you have one set of chromosomes from your mother, one set from your father. Um, but some manzanitas have two sets from their mother and father each. And so they're tetraploids. And all these different variations on manzanita have stretched out the flowering season. Uh, so that it's not just a couple of weeks, it's a month or two. And that really helps all those early pollinators because there's a continuous flush of, of new flowers out there. So this is from uh, Manzanita Park in Prindia. And what I want you to notice is that one of the species is blooming in January and pinking flower about the middle of January, but the other one is pinking toward the end of February. So they're stretching out flowers for months, and that really helps all of those bees and all the other uh, pollinators that are out there. And there's a large number of pollinators that utilize manzanitas. I didn't give you a number uh, because I couldn't find a good number, but one study found 57 different taxa. I'm sure that's a way underestimate because they were only looking at one plant. Another study in Arizona, though, found that thrips also pollinate them. You guys know thrips? Mm -hmm. Little teeny things that seem to just run around and look like messy insects. But apparently they're very successful at pollinating. Okay, who knew? Very good. And birds love them. <laughs> birds love them? Go what are they called? Thrips? Thrips. Yeah. Like a drip? Thrip. Say it again. Thrip. T-H-R-I-P-S. Here in your own park. You can stretch out the flowering season. This was two years ago. I could have done it again this year, but I didn't. Here's Montero Mountain in full bloom and uh, the end of December. And here's your brittle leaf. The buds aren't even swelling yet. Now, these are two different uh, ploidy levels. And so the diploid is it's flowering early. And the tetraploid is like, yeah, I think I'll wait a while. And they'll, they'll start coming into bloom as this one begins to peter out. And so that'll keep that flowering season going for a long time period. Okay, we've got the flowers pollinated. Now we have the fruit beginning to grow. That's good news for the plant. Oh, now we have a wave of insects arriving. And these are not happy for you plant insects. These are, I'm going to eat you kinds of insects. And a lot of them cause fruit to gall. So as the fruit's developing, they oviposit eggs on the inside and their larvae consume everything before it hardens out. And the fruit get a little bit larger than they're supposed to because there's a big uh, larval insect on the inside. But there's also a huge number of very tiny insects that oviposit into individual seeds. And they do that before the endocarp is too stony, and their larvae will just consume an individual seed out of that fruit. And then they'll emerge out of the fruit. So this looks great, doesn't it? Looks beautiful. That is a little emergence hole. <laughs> so the, this particular fruit has lost some seed. And if you start looking around on fruit when you're out there, you'll see lots of these things. Sometimes they just look like little black dots sometimes little holes, and those are emergence holes for insects that have eaten out particular seed. So these plants are food for everybody. Now why is that? How do insects get their energy? 
They have to eat something. How do you get your energy? You have to eat something. And everything eventually goes down to plants. And here are plants and they can't run away. So they have to be able to deal with this in some form or another. And they produce what? This particular plant needs how many seedlings to be successful? It, has, it needs one to replace itself. But it's going to live from 50 to 60 to 100 years, depending on the fires. And it's going to produce 10,000 seed every year. And it's going to put a lot of them in the soil, but a lot of them will be eaten by insects and rodents. Coyotes will eat a bunch and run off with them someplace else. So they won't even be near the mother any longer. So it's a tough world uh, for plants. They don't care. They can manipulate all of us animals. Did you say only they only seed when they have a fire, or do they also seed naturally? They produce seed every year, but the, it only germinates the year after a fire. Okay. So it stays dormant. Mm -hmm. So none of them germinate unless they've been in a fire. So they're they're not doing any. Right. They need, they need chemicals. They need a heat pulse. Okay. Um, Along the roadsides of highways, you sometimes see them germinating because they get the heat pulse from the traffic and the chemicals from pollution and sometimes mimic smoke from fires enough that it will stimulate germination. So, we can manipulate them too. Okay, we've got fruit <coughs> damaged by all these insects, but there's still a lot of good fruit that gets produced and that's got to get this first. And now we have a different range of creatures that we can finally talk about. We have bears, and coyotes, and foxes. Those are our major guys that are manipulating uh, dispersal. But these are long distance dispersal agents. They eat a whole bunch of fruit and then they keep moving. <coughs> so they're not gonna be depositing necessarily uh, locally. But these are very important during time periods like climate change. So we used to have ice ages all the time and the ice would come down, all the plants would move south. How are they moving? They're moving with because of these. Because they're also moving south after they've eaten a lot and then they deposit them. <coughs> and then climate changes again and they have to move north. Well, these guys will also move north and they will move uh, the fruit and seed with them. These are really important for long distance dispersal. So let's see how, this is what happens. <laughs> they produce scat. You can find it whenever you get out there. But this is not a good spot. <laughs> this is bear stuff. Right? This is without this being an area, by the way, so you don't want to be near that particular individual. That's not a good spot because these fruit are in habitats that will burn. And if you are fruit and seed sitting on the surface of the soil, you're not going to survive that fire. Right? You need to get into the soil. So how are you going to get into the soil? It's not too many times large stuff will go into fine particles. Large stuff goes to the surface as fine particles that you uh, move around and the big stuff goes up. Ask farmers about that. Fortunately for Manzanitas, they have a second round of dispersal agents, rodents. They can be cute, like chipmunks. They can be scary if you suddenly put your face in front of them and you're prowling around and chaffer out, like uh, brush mice. They can be really cute, like the Santa Cruz kangaroo rat. That's a rare uh, animal now because uh, we've destroyed too much of its habitat. It's very particular in its habitat. There are two places left for the kangaroo rat, and it loves manzanita fruit. So it'll live in pure manzanita stands and depend on manzanitas. So, is it really a rat or is it a mouse? Sorry? Is it really a rat or is it a mouse? It's a rat. rat. It's no, called rat. a rat, but it's a kangaroo rat. It's its own lineage of rats. Huh. They're all rodentia. Uh -huh. What's important about these animals for me? is that they produce seed banks in the soil for manzanitas. They bury them, and that's why I like rodents all the time. I don't like them in my house, I would kill them. I don't like them chewing up my plants in my backyard, I would trap them. But 
uh, out in the wilderness. I love manzanitas or I love rodents because they will bury the seed and that is good. Now, what was shocking to me was this is how big the fruit are. These are big fruit. These are small fruit. Uh, the size of the seed bank is dependent on the size of the fruit. And the small fruit have bigger seed banks and the big fruit have smaller seed banks. And that seems to be how easy is it for the rodents to find them again. You gotta remember, rodents have incredible noses. They're better than dogs, or maybe as good as dogs. And they can run around and they can smell fruit that have been buried in the soil. So they will form what are called uh, little caches. And they're called scatter borders because they'll put a little cache here, a little cache there, they'll put more fruit in their cheeks and then form another cache over there. And as they're doing that, if they, oh, I smell some fruit here, it's somebody else's cache. They'll dig it up, and they'll go move it someplace else. And so these guys will steal from each other over and over again. But the good news about that is that some of the fruit gets forgotten, and the manzanitas start producing the seed banks. When you have a fire, this is what it looks like from a cache. Lots of seedlings are coming up all, all together. So it's not great, because only one of them is likely to survive through time. But it, you can see that the rodents were the, the important piece here to, to get them in. Every species that I've looked at uh, post-fire, there are rodent caches all over the place. Is that within a few days? Or? Uh, it's after rain, um, and they tend to germinate late January through February, and that's when they get established. So you, you just go out in the spring. Scientists, you have to prove everything. Oh, I said those are caches. Other people say, well, maybe there was just a hole in the ground. Maybe some animal came and just dug a little hole and was going for a mushroom or something and the fruit just fell in. So you have to prove it. So we went out to prove it. We put a bunch of fruit with a pan that was covered with fluorescent powder so that you could follow the rodents after they grabbed the fruit. And sure enough, they will leave fluorescent trails, and if you have the right students with you, they can find the caches and dig them up. I'm not that good at it, turns out. Or else I could find caches that have already been stolen and moved someplace else. And it's like, why is there green powder an, an inch or two underground and no fruit? It's because I'm the one lucky enough to find the ones that others have stolen from. We found a lot. We found over 50. The average depth was 4.1 centimeters. That's roughly a little under two or three inches. What's cool about this piece of data, this means the fire is increasing in intensity. So this is a really hot fire. This is a cooler fire. Not that fires are ever cool, but it's not as bad. And what this part is, the higher up you are here, the more all the seedlings are only from caches. Right, so there's about 50-50 here, all the seedlings are from caches or isolated. Now here they're almost all from caches. So as you have higher intensity fires, the seedlings that are making it are the ones coming out of rodent caches. And that's because they're deep enough to survive the deadly heat pulse that hits the ground surface. So that's why you have to like rodents. Not just the cute chipmunks, although they're cute and they're very important. But all the other rodents are very important to you. Now, manzanitas are not passive victims here because natural selection will help them manipulate all the rodents. Now, I know you've already tried to read all this because that's what people do when you throw a slide. And that's why I try to put not very many words in because uh, then you pay attention to me when I'm talking. You've already done the reading. So, Here's how many nutlets per fruit. Well, it's pretty variable. Sometimes they don't produce very many, right? Um, this is what percentage of those nutlets are actually fused together. Let's think about that. And this is a survey of about 40 different species. So these are averages for um, 32 fruit each of about 40 species. That's a lot of fruit in there. Um, what you see is that it's really variable. And that's true within a stand, within an individual. Um, you can pull the fruit, open them up, sometimes they'll be completely fused, sometimes they'll fall apart. 
you know, there are three or four species where they they remain completely fused, but uh, the other hundred uh, they fall apart to some extent. Okay. Why is this important? Well, um, how many viable seeds do you find per fruit? Sometimes all of them. A lot of times, none or one or half of them are viable, half of them are. And this is the key part. That percent fusion and percent viability are unrelated to each other. So now, you are a rodent. Imagine. <laughs> Your nose is really good. You're going around. You dig up a cache. You're holding up four different limits that are fused together. Is there a seed in it? Or are they all empty? Here's an individual. Is there actually a seed in there? Because it's work. Rodents are economists. How much energy am I are putting into this though? It's empty. I'll go to this one. Oh, there's one out of four. Oh, I got a little bit. You know, it's time for me to get moving because I know there's a bobcat in the area. And the economics of rodents being worried about predators means that this kind of unpredictable variation is saving seed in the soil. So that's how these guys are able to not only do a good job, right, bury the seed, and they get their food, but the, seed, the plants get their seed mix. They survive. All right, so we've gotten flowers, we've made fruit, we've got the fruit dispersed. Let's go look at the adults. Do you guys have a look at the adults? when they're not in bloom? Because you can find all sorts of messy stuff. <coughs> Insects love plants. This is a leaf miner. The female will oviposit into the leaf because leaves are kind of hollow so that CO2 can circulate and get fixed in, in photosynthesis. And those little caterpillars will just, you know, little larvae will just walk around eating all the cells that are in the, the leaf. It's a massive amount of food for very small animals. Mm -hmm. now, these are examples of a lot of those leaf miners. Uh, this one is endemic to the Argentine, <coughs> that's Madrones and Manzanitas in our area. This one is endemic to Manzanitas. So you only, it's only been found on Manzanitas. But they have their larvae that eat through all the leaves. And there's like hundreds of leaves. There's a diversity of these little suckers. <laughs> now the good news is they don't do very much damage. And this becomes not only food um, for birds, um, but the birds help limit the impact of all of these caterpillars. They don't limit the impact of the leaf miners. There are some birds that are specialists, uh, but not very many that we have. This, this is really important for birds during the nesting season. And they're mostly in the spring when the new growth happens is when most of the butterflies and uh, moths lay eggs on the new growth. And they're like a good size meal. Mm -hmm. Good size meal like that. Oh, this is, yeah, you could feed two baby birds on that one. <laughs> Sometimes you might go out and see manzanitas that look kind of messed up. Ever notice these? These are little leaf galls. You get up close, they're bright red. They're really kind of pretty, except they mess the leaf up. This is really cool if you are an insect person, because these are made by aphids. Uh, the female aphid will come over here, and when the leaf is beginning to develop, they will just sting the leaf? I don't know. They will leave chemicals that will stimulate the plant to make the gall look like this. So the plant has produced this for the aphid. And all it is is the leaf swells out, leans over, creates a little chamber, and if you get inside the chamber, you find all these little aphids. This group is, is Tamalia, is the genus for these aphids. They're only found on manzanitas. One of them, 
they, well, Kumara Staphylis has one. That's the summer holly in Southern California. So that's a close relative of Manzanita. So chemically, probably pretty similar. But these guys can stimulate those galls to form, and they live there. And they're only on Manzanitas. And sometimes they specialize, like uh, Big Berry Manzanita has its own tamalia that's not found on any other Manzanita, Tamalia guacescens. Don't you love those names? That just means it's whitish. And Big Berry Manzanitas are white leaved. Will they kill the plant? Will they kill the plant? Nope. nope. I mean, it, they, they damage it for one year, but the next year they're usually gone. They, they go someplace else. How long are they in that hole? Um, they will stay there as long as it takes, but here's the other part of the story. There are other tamalias that cannot form galls, but they look for the galls. And they invade the galls and they kick out the gall farmers. <laughs> it's a messy world. Not only that, there are other insects that are parasitoids and they look for these galls, and they will oviposit their own eggs in there, and their larvae will eat the aphids. So it's, it's a tough world. I mean, it looks like, what a great idea. I will stimulate this plant to produce a protective structure for me, and I will sit there and just suck up all the flowing sugars and be happy. Or lots of little children. Nope. They have invaders. They have Attackers, it's, it's a crazy word. One guy was silly enough, and so you know they're nerds, just like me. But he surveyed a stand of the Greenleaf Manzanita, that's the high elevation Manzanita, um, for five years um, after the snow would melt and before the first snows. And he would go out there with you know, insect nets. He would put plastic tarps underneath and then beat the bushes and things like that, and then collect everything possible. And after five years, he had come up with 539 different types of insects. That's how many insects love manzanitas to some extent. There's only 11 frugivores, so those are animals that disperse fruit. There were only 11 pollinators that he was able to find. Those are the bumblebees and butterflies and everybody else. Um, so he, either he wasn't very good at it or the high elevation area doesn't have a lot of diversity. Uh, but he found 184 herbivores. Those are the leaf miners, caterpillars on the outside, you name it, deer walking by. Wow, no, these are insects. Whatever the insects are doing, a huge number of herbivores. But 161 predators of those herbivores. <laughs> so they may be thinking, yeah, we've got this whole shrub, we're going to eat it. Oh, <laughs> there's a predator taking them down. There are parasitoids that are going for both of these. Another 87. So this is a messy world for insects. There's 69 scavengers that are picking up the debris. <laughs> Good for them. And then they couldn't figure out 16. What are they doing? Nobody knew. Most of these are in the room. They also found 50 spiders, and they're not, they're not adding them to this mix. The spiders are, are a part of this group, I would guess. Yeah, I've been in some Manzanita stands where you you move over a branch and there's spider webs just drooping down and little tiny things that go down. And you don't really worry about them because they're like the size of five commas on a 12 point font, but uh, they're everywhere. It'd be interesting to know. But this is how much a, these plants are supporting in terms of insects. Bring in the birds. The birds love these insects. Uh, there's all sorts of other food web members that we're not talking about. Uh, this is just the beginning of transferring a plant to animal first. Now sometimes you might go out and see something like this. So we're going to walk away from insects for a while and turn to fungi. 
this is a fungus called Exobacidium vaccinii, and it attacks a lot of different members of the blueberry family, which mantanitas are part of. Uh, it looks terrible, and that, that little branch isn't going to do anything. Um, but it's okay because the next year they put up new branches and for some reason they seem to move to some other plants. They don't stay on one plant and eventually take it out like a terrible pathogen. They just kind of jump from one plant to another. Sometimes there's a lot. Some years there's almost nothing. And we have a lot of fungi that's associated. This is just one you happen to see. But inside each one of these leaves, there are what are called endophytic fungi. Endophytic just means inside the plant. And they spend their entire life cycles inside plants. And there's a pretty high diversity in manzanitas. Um, we extracted from one leaf on four locations of one plant. And there was overlap. One fungus was everywhere, but there were different other fungi. And it was about six different ones just on those four leaves. Two or three on each leaf. And they, we don't really know what they do. Sometimes some of those endophytic fungi will form toxic compounds if a deer comes by and starts eating branches. And that will tend to cause the deer to, yeah, maybe I'll move on a little bit. Eat. I'll eat this plant today. Um, but we don't really know what, what their function is or, other than sometimes they're good, sometimes they're not. If you find a leaf that's beginning to dry or one that has just turned brown and you have a hand lens, you can look on the on the leaf where the stomata are, and sometimes you'll see a little tiny sporangium that has come out of the stomata. And those are endophytic fungi that are like, gotta get out of here, let's sexually reproduce, or let's, let's get some spores out there, find another leaf. And you can see that those endophytic fungi are everywhere. You can see with oak leaves pretty readily as well, the ones that are on the ground. So just have a hand lens with you. Is there a coincidence that in this case in the fungi, the, it's red, and with the galls, the red. Yeah, the plant is producing the colors. The plant is. Mm -hmm. And these are anthocyanins that uh, protect uh, the cell's DNA from UV radiation that can damage DNA. And why they turn red? No, don't ask me that question. I'm a botanist. <laughs> <laughs> do the do the fungi? that whole plant, you know, they go from one side to the other, or, or do they skip, can they somehow jump over to another plant? It, it seems like they just have one or a couple of branches of new growth, and then the next year that particular individual usually doesn't have that problem, and other individuals do, or nobody does that either. So I, I haven't seen a consistent pattern with this. Mm -hmm. I just always see it because it's bright red, yeah. and it sticks out and I'm happy to know what it is. But horticulturalists know a lot more about it than I do because they get asked these questions. Well, I'm sure I'm asked this. <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> you could probably cut it off. You've probably seen bark striping in manzanitas where the bark is here, but it doesn't always go all the way around. Sometimes it looks like it's died off in areas. Sometimes if it, like this area, this area died and then this area grew, it's beginning to grow over it and then it died back a little bit. These are great places. These are all living branches, by the way. Uh, living part of the bark is just under the, the stems and you just can't see it. But these now become good habitat for other animals, mostly small invertebrates. Right? They can get in here, form little nests, they can hide. There's all sorts of things that they can do there. And one particular group of insects that are really good at that are ants. There's a lot of arboreal ants that will form nests um, in those dead bark areas. And if you go hang out with our manzanitas, uh, you have to be patient and you can start seeing ants walking all over the place. So super high diversity, unless they're Argentine ants in the neighborhood. The Argentine ants drive everybody away except for one, one native ant species is like, I don't care. And the Argentine ant ants leave them alone. I don't know why, but they do. Um, but there's a really high diversity of ants that live there. I, I led a hike on Mount George once, and there was an ant specialist from Davis on the hike. 
and you know, I was really happy because we had four different manzanita species. That's pretty high diversity for a place. And he goes, oh, I've seen 27 species of ants on their trips. <laughs> okay, maybe you should have led the trip and showed us all those little ants. It's really, that's just an indication that there's a huge diversity uh, that are taking uh, opportunities that these things have created. Now, there are also a lot of animals that are indirectly using manzanitas. This little guy freaked me to death. This is a sharp-tailed snake, and sharp-tailed snakes eat invertebrates that live in litter. And manzanitas often form pretty deep litter layers, uh, one to three to six inches, depending on how old they are, and if it's not a steep slope. And the sharp-tailed snakes love those little invertebrates. So I was there to collect a soil sample, and I started moving the litter. And this little snake was there, and it reared up like a cobra, and I freaked out. And then it's going, to say, okay, it's not a, it's not a rattlesnake or anything to worry about. And it was hissing at me, so I took pictures. Do they bite? And then I picked it up and moved it over so I could do my soil sample. But that was really cool. Of the nine or ten thousand miles of trails that I've hiked, I've only run into like six of these, but this one was from this spring, so you get to see it. And the good news is it looks like um, it had a few meals, and so it was very passive. Um, it was on a flat area of the trail, and I was coming up the steep part, so I'm, of course, not looking at the trail. I'm looking at the shrubs on both sides. And I got within about a meter, and yeah, adrenaline rush. And you take a step back, and then you go, oh, it's not even responding. I mean, I have tortured rattlesnakes before with sticks and stones, and they will do things like, this one didn't do anything. So it was like, it was very passive. What are they doing? So this one's eating invertebrates. This one's eating vertebrates. So all those wonderful rodents that have cached all my seed to create those seed banks, thank you, Mr. Rattlesnake. So I get to thank the rodents and I get to thank the rattlesnakes. Side question, is the sharp-tailed snake a biter? A biter? Yeah, a biter is it toxic to us like a rattlesnake. It's not toxic at all. They won't, okay. They might bite you. But if you put your finger up there and start poking <laughs> okay, it, they, thank you. they will protect themselves. They're a snake. <laughs> but no, they, what are you going to do then? Because sometimes when they bite, they just hang on. And that happened to me when I was a kid. But it was a little green grass, we call them grass snakes. And I'm, I'm going, okay, I know it's not toxic, but what am I going to do? We're getting to hurt. So, and it was a long snake. So I got a bucket, I filled it with water, and I dumped it in there. And after a minute or two, the snake lets go and gets out. Thank so, goodness. I'm not going to be able to do that in the chaparral, so I don't put my fingers on <laughs> Good news is I'm wearing gloves anyway. I just, you need to see that there are other animals that are part of the system. Now, they're not endemic to manzanitas, but uh, they depend upon manzanitas providing them with uh, their food. They're part of the food chain. There are other locals that are also indirectly dependent. So those 500 plus insects that are on manzanitas, uh, these are insectivorous birds. Uh, red tits are only found in Chaparral. Black phoebes, um, they, they're all over Pacifica. Uh, they're also all over Chaparral uh, throughout the state. And they're, they love to go for all those little insects that are consuming manzanitas. So all of these uh, indirect guys are, are important to keep the manzanitas there, even though they're supporting all these other that's the above ground. We have a below ground world too. And manzanitas usually live in really poor soils. And because of that, um, those poor soils are often pretty dry as well. And they have mutualists that help them. And those mutualists are uh, fungi, mostly the city of my seeds. Uh, there are a lot of house of my seeds, if you know the difference. Um, and manzanitas have a particular kind of mycorrhizae called arbutoid, 
and it's found only in the small subfamily that they're in. Some of the drones have the same uh, mycorrhizal root. And it is a specialized root that is formed by the plant and the fungus. And so it's a, a, a mutual uh, construction. So what you're seeing here is that's all fungal hyphae on the outside. And then there's a layer of the surface of the root and the hyphae enter the root and in arbutoid, they actually push in the, the edge of the cell wall, or they go through the cell wall and they push in the cell membrane and they proliferate next to the cell and they exchange materials across those membranes. And the plant provides carbon to the fungi and the fungi provide nitrogen and other nutrients. And in dry soils, they provide water if their hyphae are deep enough. So it's a nice mutual exchange. Manzanitas have huge numbers. In a, in a stand about the size of this room, we did 32 cores and we found over 120 species of fungi associated with roots. Okay. If you were to look for fungal fruiting bodies, you could find 10 or 12. So most of them are hiding from you and they pop up some years but not every year. And otherwise they're just there doing their job because that's their their main body. These are just reproductive structures and they don't need to reproduce it. Yeah. A huge proportion of those fungi are shared with conifers. And that means conifers can invade Mancini stands because they can get in there, oh it's a little too shady, but I've tapped into the hyphal network and I can steal carbon from the fungi, which is getting it from the plant. And also the fungi will provide them with water so the seedlings can make it through that first year. And then they can emerge and begin to suppress by uh, shading uh, the manzanitas. But don't worry if fire will take out all those conifers and the manzanitas have dormancy. Fire stimulates them, it becomes a manzanita stand again. So it's a nice long process. But you go to the Sierra Nevada, for example, and people are like freaked out. It's a shrubland. Oh, where are trees? Well, the time scale for humans and the time scale for vegetation are a little different. We tend to think of one or two years as a long time period, 20 years as extensive. Right? These plants are thinking in centuries. Right? Yeah, a couple centuries will be bad. Maybe 100 years. Fire will take out these conifers. Good, good to go. A lot of different ones. Russula's cordinarius is a really common genus. Do you know Lactarius? Lactarius, if you, if you cut the gills like that, they bleed milky substance, which is where it gets its name, like lactation. Uh, Romaria are the coral fungi. Uh, they're kind of cool. One species is called dead man fingers. It's like dead fingers coming up about other Perfect for Halloween coming up. <laughs> um, I tried to learn how to identify these ones. I, I got reasonably good. My, my son, when he was about six, brought me a little mushroom from up the hill, and I keyed it out, and uh, I had to lie to him <coughs> what it was, because it was actually uh, psilocybe, you know, psilocybin. <laughs> so it, it was a species that's not very potent. You would probably have to eat bucket full and then throw up, but uh, I didn't want to tell him that it was Slossum, even though he, didn't, he wouldn't have known what that is. I tried to keep Russulos once, and they are a really difficult group, and when I was a young professor on a field trip with a bunch of mycologists, I found a big Russula, and I'm very impressed, because you know, they can get really large, and sometimes they have a slight reddish cover, so I, there was a graduate student nearby, and I gave it to her, and I said, can you help me identify this? And she goes, well, it, it looks like a russula. She sort of looks at it a little bit, and then she drop kicks it. It bursts into like 90 little pieces. She goes, yeah, it's a russula. <laughs> Can't really key them, but they're very fragile. Most mushrooms you drop kick, they just look like it. Why do I still remember that? 
it was an experience that you don't forget. <laughs> you're thinking someone's going to tell you what it is, and they go, <laughs> <laughs> that'll happen to you one of these days. The mycorrhizae, if you put them with cool backgrounds, are really lovely. Uh, this particular species can be found on uh, manzanitas, but this happens to be Douglas fir roots. So it's also on. <laughs> You notice the shape of these is a little different looking than these. And these are arbutoid and these are on arcostaphyls. And that's a, a lactarius. Really pretty, I thought you would like these. So that, you know, manzanitas are not only beautiful above ground, beautiful below ground. As long as you clean them up. Okay, so we have our manzanitas with all these animals and fungi of various types all over them. What's going to happen next? This is Mount George looking down into Napa, the city of Napa. We have to burn it all. This isn't the Atlas fire, but might as well be. Mount George burned it out. Did you know that there are beetles that specialize in post-fire sites? They love the post-fire sites, not because there are manzanitas there or other plants, but because the fire gets rid of all their predators. And they rush there and they lay their eggs. And some of them are particular to conifers and they will lay eggs in the wood, but it has to be a freshly killed conifer. Otherwise, there's nothing for their, their babies to eat. And this is a scanning electron micrograph of an area underneath the middle leg of this particular species. And these little bumps are all infrared sensors. They can detect heat. And what they do is, if there's a, a heat gradient, and it's hot enough that they think it might be a fire, they fly toward the fire, right? Most animals you think of as run away from fire, these guys fly to it. Some of them are, have smoke detectors, some of them have these heat detectors, and they love to go um, to those fresh burn sites, even as it's cooling. So they're called fire-loving animals. We also have fire-loving fungi. And manzanita stands do have some of these. Mostly, uh, they're ascomycetes. Uh, there are a lot of ascidiomycetes that also come up uh, that are considered fire-loving. Some of them are really cute. <laughs> Okay, but what have, we, what have we seen today? We've seen pollinators, predators of those insects that eat the plants. A lot of large mammals that do the long distance dispersal and rodents that are nice enough to bury the seeds. Um, mycorrhizal fungi that uh, help these plants get established and survive the dry periods. Manzanitas also create great habitat for mammals and other invertebrates and other kinds of fungi. But we also have fruit gallers, seed weevils, leaf miners, leaf gallers. Don't you love those names? If you, if you sort of growl it out, it sounds bad. <laughs> leaf gallers. But if you say leaf gallers, <laughs> they sound so much nicer. Uh, fungi that attack leaves, herbivores. All sorts of animals are associated with it. A really high, high diversity of things, right? What do we actually have? I have to always end with a bad joke so that you guys are happy and we know you've gone to a park. So we have the good, the bad. What are we going to do? We have to go to the third one, right? No, I don't really think of it as ugly, but it's the best I can do. I want to leave you with the idea that manzanitas are a central player in an ecosystem that we call chaparral. Chaparral has a, almost a quarter of the plant diversity of California. Okay. Now, a huge amount of that diversity is post-fire, um, but the shrubs themselves are a very diverse uh, group of plants. But not just the plant diversity, but all of those different organisms that we went through, and there's many of them that I didn't obviously tell you about. But it's a huge diversity of other organisms that are associated with these plants. They are the photosynthetic things. They create 
the energy that everybody else gets to live on and they can't run. So everybody can go up to them and figure out how to deal with them. Natural selection helps them figure out how to manipulate that. Right? But that takes generations. Beautiful building. So I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll leave you with how pretty these guys are. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to. To support which? Germination of you know, new Mercedes. We don't have fire here. Have, yeah, you need a fire. So basically, no go. Not until you get a fire. And you will get one eventually. Right? You don't want to have a home too close. I'm, I'm way more. <laughs> I'm close to the coast. But that's what it would take. It would take at least the now sometimes they'll they respond to disturbance if there's uh, not a disturbance in the middle of no place but disturbance that might be in a polluted area um, sometimes that's enough to stimulate a few individuals uh, sometimes uh, seeds get really old and uh, they begin to break down and chemistry of the soil might be enough to stimulate them so that does that mean that the plants that are here are old they're like old 50 100 the last fire. The last fire. Okay. Yeah, you can you can go to some of the big manzanitas and cut them down and uh, count the rings. If you're going to do that. <laughs> but a lot of them do respond to disturbance. So you probably have some young ones as well. So why do burrows form on one of the two manzanitas here? Why do burrows form on one species and not on the other? So the, the subfamily that manzanitas are in, all of them have burrows. So it's not something they developed, it's something that's historic, uh, that's part of their lineage. And nobody knows why they have that particular shape. It may go all the way back to dinosaurs as herbivores eating everything, and they just re-sprout. Arbutus goes back 62 million years, that's not quite far enough for dinosaurs, but we did have uh, megafauna at one point. It might be the, and we had mammoths that would <laughs> be damaging. But it's probably historically associated with fire. Fire has been a part of uh, Earth as soon as plants invaded uh, the surface of the planet. It, the new thing is not having a burrow and considering that a fire adaptation. Because you you, that only happens when they have dormant seed in the soil. The Ceanothus and Arctostaphylus, uh, a lot of pines with closed cones, those are the ones that, that are considered obligate seeders. Um, and that's a, their fire adaptation. Um, so, how do you nurture these crops? Do you put them in the sand, do they? Um, it's all by cuttings. It's all by cuttings? Okay. They, it's not too hard as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and it so takes a while. They can, um, you don't need a restock or anything there. I can't read your lips. Oh, you said they, 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 they don't need a restock or anything like that. It's not a graph, it's just a cutting that they that roots. So I'm not sure what you said, but I think you said they. Just from a cutting. Just from a cutting. Yeah, almost all of them are just from cuttings. People are trying to, to figure out how to germinate manzanitas. And, uh -huh. um, there's been a few successful studies, but it's, it's um, first of all, you notice the fruit are variable in how many seed are actually there. So you can stimulate a bunch of fruit, like 100 of them, and maybe you've only got 40 seed. And of that 40 seed, maybe you can only germinate 20. But you, in the same time period, you could have gone out and collected lots of stems and made cuttings. So a horticultural yeah. stem to think, this is the way to do it. And they're good at it. So is that a totally different question, but then when we get into the mycorrhizal, the, the, the soil people's <laughs> things, and when we get into that, and how do, they, how do you introduce that into like your, your own little 
yard and stuff like that with those plants. Historically, people would have moved soil, but now we have Phytophthora, so um, yeah. the, other thing, <laughs> the other thing you can do is just grab um, mushroom bodies that come up underneath manzanitas, put them in a blender with water. So I got one that loves Because those are reproductive structures filled with spores, and you just pour it into the soil of your, of your new cutting and increase diversity. That's what I did in my yard. Yard. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to move soil, I just moved <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> the madrone you talked about, can that be grown from cutting? The which ones? The madrone. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't know if, mush, if madrone, I'm sure every woody plant can be grown from cuttings. Sure. But I don't know if that's how they do it. Madrones, you can germinate readily. Right? They just stay really tiny for a long time. Here. Mm -hmm. What's that? They are. Um, there is a small subfamily of the blueberry family uh, called the Arbutoidae, and it has madrones as the ancient group. And there's, we have one madrone in California, but there's another one in Arizona, another one in Texas, about six or eight in uh, Mexico. And then the Mediterranean region has three more. It's a, it's a old group. Uh, there are fossils that go back uh, over 39 years in North America. I got a question from somebody asking what kind of manzanita uh, to plant maybe like a few blocks away from the ocean? Um, a lot of them. <laughs> so um, Ed Munzii and Big Sur. Um, Crustacea variety or subspecies rosei in Big Sur. Um, in Santa Barbara, um, Arctostatus purissima, the La Purissima Mission Manzanita, it hangs out on coastal bluffs along with um, Arctostatus rudus, another Santa Barbara endemic. Um, uh, Arctostatus hookeri. Some species Hurst Diorum found only in the grasslands of Hurst Ranch. Um, you could throw a rock into the ocean from where they are. There's a, there's a large number of them. Torrey Pines has an endemic manzanita in Southern California. There's a bunch on islands that are endemic on islands. How close do you want? Do you want to be well, <laughs> lift, looking down at the water? Or can they be a kilometer away? Okay. But probably. Nothing in the Pacifica. The Pacifica one seems to be all high. Pacifica Manzanita. Okay. Um, mostly it's soil here. Mm -hmm. The soils next to the ocean are uh, mostly shales that break down to clay. That's not good Manzanita <coughs> property. Um, okay, so that, that might be a problem with the growing up close to the ocean. What about the salty air right near the ocean? Does that have a damaging effect? Growing next to the ocean? Yes. Yes. Um, the soil having obviously some salt in it, plus the air having salt in it, but that maybe would have a detrimental effect? Mm -hmm. Or that plants would have to adapt to, obviously? Yeah, uh, but mostly, in some cases, they adapt by becoming short. Uh -huh. uh, but mostly, if they can't tolerate the salt, they wouldn't be there very long. Right. Um, because the storm winds will take sand and blast them, and they'll cause little holes in the leaves, and then the salt can get in there and start damaging the leaf and killing it off. Which is why a lot of shrubs next to the ocean are dead on the ocean side, and they look like they're growing away from the ocean, uh, because that's the only tips left alive if there's a lot of sand and, and salt spray at that location. When you were mentioning the pines, the conifers and, and manzanitas, you said that the, you were mentioning the uh, mycorrhizal connection. Mm -hmm. Is it wouldn't it work two ways? If, if the conifers can can tap into the manzanitas, mm -hmm. then there's a connection there. Wouldn't the manzanitas be able to tap something back? Yes, and they inadvertently shown that in Northern California where they thinned out the forest and then they try to burn out all the understory and they stimulate a crop of manzanitas that, thank you conifers, that's what happened to your mycorrhizal network. 
and get established. It's not what they wanted because now they got a fuel bed underneath <laughs> their conifers that they were hoping to get rid of by burning. Uh, it's a, life is a mess when you think you can garden. <laughs> yeah. Is there another question? How many species of um, manzanita are here in the park? Uh, you've got two in this park. So the Montanaxis and the brittle leaf. Brittle leaf. Brittle leaf. Crustacea, crustacea. If, if I may, one, one last question, if I may. You were mentioning by a diploid and tetraploid. Tetra 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 hmm? Are there any, try the ones with three? Um, with the three sets of, of genes? Are there, are there any successful species that are triplets? Yes. No. Um, occasionally there's a successful individual, um, but it's not usually... It's um, not viable. It's, it's not long-term viable, but sometimes they make it. Uh -huh. And they're the step to get a, a successful trip, uh, tetraploid. Mm -hmm. So all they need is a diploid pollen grain, and then they, uh -huh. they can produce a tetraploid. And it's all happy. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. thank you so, so much for that talk.